Hello, it's Scott Manley here. What you're looking at is a 3D reconstruction of a recently created crater on Mars, one of the largest craters ever observed since the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter arrived in orbit around Mars and began surveying the Martian surface in extreme detail and cataloging the changes as they happened. This crater is about 150 meters or 500 feet across and it's definitely one of the largest that has been observed. But this particular crater is in the news because it was simultaneously observed by InSight. Now InSight is a few thousand miles away. It's sitting still on the surface, but it has a seismometer which has been used to basically listen to the interior sounds of Mars and do geology. This also isn't the first time that we've found craters that are linked to InSight data. These are a few craters which were announced in September, but these are very, very small. They're only about five meters across. And so this is the first time we've seen a crater this large with a seismic signature. And this means we can listen to the sounds of Mars. Now, to be clear, this is a hundred times faster than normal. So yeah, this whole seismic wave echoes around inside Mars and obviously gives us some clues as to the interior, but it's formed from a single short event that had an energy probably between 100 and 1,000 tonnes of TNT from an impactor hitting the surface and making this substantial crater. Now the paper actually looks at two different impact events, but the further event actually turned out to be very hard to model and I think they're still working on it. The problem is that it's so far away that the sound waves or the seismic waves get perturbed around the core and the analysis becomes more difficult. Also, the impact site happened to be on the side of like a, a grabbin, so it was much harder to characterize the impact and figure out the energy. Observers were quickly able to find the impact because it was large enough to be observed in the wide-scale Marcy camera. That's the camera that is used to do global maps of Mars more or less every day. Yeah, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has three different cameras. It has Marcy, the Mars Color Imager, and that's like has a resolution of 0.6 miles per pixel. The context camera provides a wider context for the high-rise camera, which can image features down to like a, a one foot or half a meter. So to give you an idea of the scale between these cameras, uh, this is a 2014 video which talked about uh, an impact in 2012. So we start out the, at the global level looking at big dust storms and we zoom in using the uh, Marcy. And Marcy again has a resolution of about 0.6 miles per pixel or one kilometer per pixel. And you see between March 27th and March 28th, there is enough of a difference that we can see this big ejecta blanket, which has been uh, deposited on the surface. Now we switch to the context camera, which is higher resolution, and you can see the crater and identify its location. And again, compare it to an image that had been taken previously. But the time scale on these images is much further apart. Again, we can then zoom in with the high rise camera, the high resolution camera, and get in close. And at this level, we can see detailed sections of the shape and we can see secondary impact craters which have formed from large chunks of ejecta which have been tossed out and then hit back down on the surface to make these secondary craters. All of these cameras are push broom imagers recording stripes of data as the satellite moves over the surface of Mars. And you know basically the ones that are higher resolution record successively narrower strips due to bigger optics. So anyway, this is what Mars looked like in December of 2021, waiting for the impact to happen. Again, they're looking at the weather in this frame. And by the way, InSight right now is having trouble with a dust storm, which is reducing its power levels so that it's actually had to turn off its seismometer. In the long term, InSight is probably about to die this year because its solar panels just aren't getting cleaned off. And you can do a quick before and after at this scale. By the way, that big white spot, that is Olympus Mons. You can see how the clouds change from one date to the next. The impact crater should have happened there, but it's too small to see on this scale. 
It's only when you zoom in to the raw data that you can see these events. And I believe now that they are using machine learning to identify these kind of events so that they can automate the process rather than have people scanning these images by hand. Zooming down to the context camera gives us the before and after showing that you have a nice flat plane that they are working with. On the right, you can see this ejecta pattern. It's much darker than material that has been lifted up and deposited. And there's important stuff in the, the shapes that these have laid out. While the hugely explosive energies of an impact almost always make a circular crater, the ejecta patterns will still preserve some of the velocity of the incoming uh, bolide. So in this case, the ejecta patterns suggest that the object came from the southwest. If you look to the top right, there's a spray of ejecta going further in that direction. The analysis in the paper also notes these rays that head out to the northwest and kind of to the south. Those are marked by the C pointer. That is a result of an interaction between the shock wave of the bolide traveling through the atmosphere and the blast wave. And these actually let them figure out exactly the direction that this thing was coming from. And when we finally zoom in using the high-rise camera, well, first of all, we see this relatively large crater, but we also see these white spots all over here. And it's believed that this has this event has ex excavated ice, and this ice is slowly sublimating and returning to you know the atmosphere. Now, this is a big deal if that's ice, because it shows that wherever you go, you're probably going to find substantial quantities of water. We do also have some close-up images of the other impact site, but as I said, they weren't so interested in this because it was on a surface which was much more geologically complex. Therefore, it was harder to constrain the parameters of the impactor and therefore the energy involved. Now, on the seismometer side, what they've shown is that the signatures of these impacts is t very different from actual tectonic events. Uh, like Mars quakes happen much deeper inside the crust, but when you have an impactor, the energy gets you know deposited in the top 100 meters or so of the surface. So it gets d produces different kind of waves. They also think it's the first time that they've unambiguously identified surface waves. So most of the waves that they look at are body waves that travel through the interior, either um, P or S type waves. But surface waves obviously travel along the surface. They can either go up or down or they can shake from side to side. But this is a kind of an important thing. There are actually, you know, as humans, when we feel an earthquake, we are feeling the surface waves. We're not feeling the push waves that are interior to the body. And so the second paper published by the team basically exploits these surface waves to understand a little more about the Martian crust. One of their observations, for example, puts the the velocity of propagation of surface waves at uh, about 3.2 kilometers per second in the region immediately below the surface. And that this is actually stronger than the crust immediately below the InSight lander. So that has implications for the other seismic data coming from InSight. Now, the question you're all asking is, how big an object did it take to knock a 150 meter hole in Mars and shake the planet in this way? Well, look, it's hard to tell because you didn't see it beforehand, but using what we've seen, you can build simulations and you can smash objects and see what kind of sounds and what kind of craters they make. And you produce this sort of probabilistic clustering that says the mass had to be about 500 tons and the velocity was probably about seven kilometers per second. And it probably hit at an angle close to 30 degrees, where, of course, 90 degrees would be straight down. So this object is a lot smaller than the event that we saw at Chilibins, uh, you know, about a decade ago. We actually see these kiloton-sized events in the Earth's atmosphere every few weeks. But the difference is Mars has 1% of the atmosphere. So these things reach all the way to the surface and can make these big holes in the ground. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.